Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to the first webinar Wednesday of uh, 2022. We're back, and uh, as you probably recall my voice, uh, my name is Scott with Vector Corrosion Technologies, and I'm happy to be your, your moderator here today for today's webinar. I hope the uh, the holiday season has uh, detentioned you, uh, and I hope you're you're uh, you're ready for some post tensioning uh, education here today. That was my that was my post tensioning joke. Hope you liked it. Um, so uh, we have a great show here today for you. We have Mike Kernan on on deck, ready to present about uh, evaluation, repair, and protection of unbonded post tensioning in parking structures specifically. So uh, without further ado, let's move it forward here. As you know, Webinar Wednesday is hosted by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. It's a like-minded group of organizations committed to advancing best practices in the field of concrete preservation and infrastructure renewal. Uh, as you know, we draw on all our members uh, and their expertise and their um, experience in the field uh, in saving structures to uh, to deliver these webinars. And um, and we have Mike here from Vector Construction today. But here's a list of all our members. And uh, again, it is a growing group over time. Um, I'll give them a little bit of air time here today. Thank you for being members. Um, if you've joined us here today, you probably went to this website, which is the home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance, wesavestructures.info. Um, if you uh, go to the events tab there, there are two streams, one for our bridge preservation series that has completed this past July in, uh, in 2021, and the new webinar series for parking structure restoration uh, that is ongoing right now. You can register for new webinars there. You can also look for videos of past uh, webinars, so the recordings and the slide decks that those speakers used. So I encourage you to come back often and look for new information. Uh, and we always like to hear from you. So if you have any feedback for us, uh, please uh, email info at wesafestructures.info, which is quite confusing, but <laughs> please email us there. We, uh, we would love to hear from you. So on to today's main show here. Um, Mike Kernan, Divisional Manager for uh, Vector Construction in Illinois. Mike has uh, experience in the field of post-tension evaluation, corrosion mitigation, and unbonded post-tensioned tendon replacement and repair. He has certifications from both PTI, the Post-Tensioning Institute, uh, in unbonded PT installation, unbonded PT repair, and multi-strand and grouted uh, he's also a multi-stranding uh, and grouted PT specialist. Now, just a personal note for Mike, and I just learned this this morning, but um, he uh, he likes uh, really sweet mimosas and long walks on the beach and uh, and summer rain, as I understand it, right? Is that correct, Mike? All three of those. All Lo those lovely. Three. Before I turn it over to you, because I always forget this, is we have, um, we would encourage you to ask questions of Mike here today, and we can incent you, we'll sweeten the pot a bit, by offering up an Amazon gift card for $100. So the best question, uh, as deemed by Mike today, will receive a $100 Amazon gift card. So let the questions roll. It isn't necessarily the hardest question, as Mike has, um, as Mike does like easy questions too, but he gets the pick. So uh, please submit your question using the Q&A function um, on, your, on your screen here now. But uh, Mike, I see your screen's all up and you're ready for the history of post-tensioning and parking structures. Are you good to oh, go? Yeah. yeah, we're gonna put the entire focus on history. No, no, not at all. So thank you, Scott. Really appreciate the handoff and greetings, everybody. Um, based on the attendee list and everything, we have people from around the world, so it's, it's fantastic. I also see that we have some really phenomenal PT experts out there that know quite a bit about post-tension. So that's good because that leads to some really good questions and some good discussions here. Um, coming from the vector construction side, there will be a kind of a construction skew in this all. So yeah, I think it's a good play because a lot of the people who are attending are engineers and I think it leads to some, um, some, some balance here. So anyways, as many of you know, there's a variety of it, but uh, PT was introduced into the US, at least on the uh, unbonded side for buildings and parking structures in the 1950s. Uh, a significant amount of increase in PT usage between 1965 and 85. And that, of course, that's in the PowerPoint, but what does that mean? Why, why is that so important? Well, it, it's so important is because we had so much growth during that time period, but the standards by which post tensioning was implemented and used and 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 done the, from the constructability and all the rest varied quite a bit during that time period we saw a lot of different systems so when you come in to evaluate a more um 
typical reinforced garage, there's not a lot of surprises. You know, the reinforcement, maybe it's 12 by 12 on centers or six by six or whatever it may be. It's not that different from the other parking garage that's at. But when you get into a PT structure, if it was built in 1970s, it could be a button head, which is uh, the picture in the bottom left. It could be a paper wrap system. It, you know, there's a whole variety of hybrids. There wasn't the standards that were being enforced throughout the entire time. So people took kind of maybe what they were familiar with and deviated it. So you really, uh, I, I can't say this too quickly because I'd mess up the words, but you're almost like a PTPI, a private investigator when you start working on these jobs because you really got to start digging in. And it'd be really nice if you just be, were able to just open up the drawings and the as builts and just see all of this details. In most cases, especially when it comes to repairs, uh, when we're looking at this for, for older structures, that's just not available. So modern day standards of more of the encapsulated uh, monostrand systems really started being implemented in 85. The latest edition of the post-tensioning manual, which I, I always put a huge plug in for PTI, phenomenal organization, really need need the support and, and people to, to be part of that organization. But anyways, they have some excellent resources and uh, the last one, the sixth edition was edited in 2006. So, but those those details are again critical because you become that investigator and that investigator this is we always fall back upon you know best practices and best practices are you know you can look at something and you could jump to conclusions pretty quick about what's wrong or what may be the problems but you're going to want to work through this decision tree trust don't worry we're not going to break this decision tree down by piece by piece by piece but there's some key points of this in the evaluation process for post-tensioning um, that's unique. So the evaluation process really starts with the field observations in many cases. I like to start with the field observations and then go back to drawings or, you know, kind of a combination of those two to really try to figure out what you're looking at. But <clears throat> because of the constructability of the way post-tensioning work, if your PT slab starts showing cracking, you have an issue. If you start seeing delaminations and other issues and uh, um, other spalls with concrete, now it's time to really start digging into it and see why that, that concrete's under stress. It's being squeezed together. There, there's definitely advantages to the post tension slabs because of this. Um, a lot of times, and now this, this instance in the bottom left is a little bit extreme, but you start seeing the corrosion around the anchors. You start seeing the grouting around the pockets disappearing. And once you start having that, then you really open yourself up to corrosion. Um, and of course, the telltale sign that you have a problem with your post-tension strands, your tendons is uh, eruption. You have one sticking through the soffit. In most cases, you're gonna see it sticking through the, the soffit or you start seeing in a high point, it's sticking through the slab. Um, those are dead giveaways, obviously. Um, other signs, you know, just to highlight, you know, you see photos like this all the time is these are the grout pockets and you're seeing the corrosion activity start to seep through that grout and start coming out. Obviously, you don't need to do a half cell study at this point to know that you have a corrosion issue. How significant is that corrosion? Um, unknown at this point, but enough of it to start showing signs here. Of course, here's some more signs of um, this one is from a, this is, uh, you never know if you're upside down or in, inside out, but this is actually a soffit here on the left. And this one's been chipped out a little bit. You can see some on the PT and the mono strand. Moisture, I can't reinforce enough that when you're looking at a post tension and you start seeing significant amount of moisture problems at expansion joints, at construction joints, where the water's coming through and really flowing through, what, what you most likely have in a lot of those cases, you have either a dead end or it could be a live end anchorage or something at that, depending on the constructability of it. You you have anchorages at the point. So if you're having water intrusion to the point like that middle photo or, or even the one to the right where it's running through, it probably means that you're getting some significant amount of water. If you were, if that structure was built in the early 80s or before that, the, it was not fully encapsulated. That's a great source of water just to go straight down um, the sheathing and be, be able to be throughout the entire cable. So 
water is is uh, is enemy number one. There's a lot of different testing methodologies out there. Um, and a lot of this is common throughout, you know, it doesn't matter if it's post tension or not, but um, I've gone ahead and highlighted what the, the, the testing procedures that we find most efficient in analyzing and taking a look at, you know, what the, what your post tension structure is, the condition of it. I uh, can't say it enough. I don't give it a fancy name, but hammer sounding, of course, is your age old friend when it comes to concrete. Um, repair and it, that's true with repair uh, with post tensioning as well. Ground penetrating radar becomes a very significant and important tool at PT. You can't see where those PT cables are in most cases. Sometimes even the the anchor ends are hidden, so you you don't know what you're looking at. So having a good qualified um, GPR technician to be able to assist you in analyzing and working backwards to figure out what you're looking at, especially in the absence of drawings, is so significantly important. Um, this is an underrated skill or underrated use by the other trades, um, mostly electri uh, electricians and plumbers. When they're working in parking structures, it's it's vital that these uh, these trades are using GPR services to be able to figure out where those ten, uh, those tendons are. In most cases, you're going to have a two way slab, so you got tendons you know all over the place. So corrosion testing, uh, half cell testing, very very important, very very useful tool to be able to go along and figure out how much active corrosion do you have in the tendons? How much active corrosion is at the anchorage points? And what do you see um, from that side? Um, kind of skips a little bit quickly on sometimes, but there's a, something called the screwdriver penetration test. And this test is used in determining, um, helping to determine if you have a broken strand. So if you're able to take a flathead screwdriver, and stick it between this uh, one of the uh, so you got seven wires in there. If you're able to put it between the the wires and work that flathead screwdriver in between those wires, you have a broken strand without a doubt. When you have a a, a strand that has been tensioned, a tendon that has been tensioned, you know it's sitting at 29 kips or 28 kips or 25. It doesn't really matter. You're never going to be able to get that screwdriver in between those wires. It doesn't matter how hard you pound on a hammer. It's just not going to happen. The only thing I want to caution you on is that if you do the screwdriver test, the penetration test, and you're not able to get in there, do not just assume 100% that that strand is not broken. Uh, rust pack, um, maybe improper installation where parts or sections of the tendon can become bonded to the concrete around it may keep certain sections of that tendon. Maybe that part you're looking at is still under tension because it's kind of locked in place, kind of like a hybrid or unintentional bonded tendon. So, so put your details, your, your other observations in play when you're taking a look at that. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time and talk about the post-tech corrosion evaluation. This is when you're really getting into uh, a mono strand or in case, and you can do this with bonded grout tendons as well, measuring the amount of moisture in there. And, and the level of moisture is directly correlated with the corrosion potential. Obviously, the higher your, your moisture levels, the higher your corrosion potential. Um, these other ones I'm going to, do, going to cover as we move through. So PTI, this is from their documentation. They, you know, they help you evaluate a plan because when you're looking at a parking garage, where do you start? What do you look at? So you have some physical characteristics by which you may want to, to focus on in the beginning. Cracking, spalling, uh, corrosion, signs of corrosion. Those are some obvious. Look around your expansion joints. But typically you're going to have a profile to that tendon, high points and low points as it moves through. Um, middle of the slab is typically your low point and near the columns is when, you're, when you're, your banded tendons are, are, or your just, uh, tendons will be at this high point. And you know, so on your low points, you're coming down, you're coming from the soffit and you're making an investigation or your high points, you may be coming from the slab up above. 
Here's an example just showing you a technician working through on a screwdriver test. This one has been cleaned up pretty nicely. Uh, very nice job in getting some uh, um, cutting, saw cutting the edges, getting a nice chip. So you have a good ability. So you're doing two things here when you're looking at this. You're looking at the condition of the tendon. Is there pitting? Is there corrosion going on? What's the condition of the grease? This particular tendon, it's really difficult to see. I don't see any sheathing whatsoever. So was there sheathing and it was just removed? I don't know, that's a pretty clean one or, or was it just a bad insulation or, or this could be near a uh, anchorage point or the sheathing had been removed during the stressing process. But you can see the screwdriver being stuck between those two wires. Uh, the corrosion evaluation, this is the moisture, and this could again be, be done on monostrand unbonded and grouted uh, tendons. But you're going to have an import, an input, and an output here. And at the input, you're going to use a dry gas, um, nitrogen. And so this is something that has a very, very low moisture in there. So any moisture you're reading on the output end is being, is, is being gathered from the tendon itself. So you have a defined length. You put the input of this dry glass gas on one end. You're measuring the flow and you're measuring the moisture level on the output side of that. And then you correlate those results. And that correlation allows you to put the cable into three different categories. You have a dry, you have a wet dry, and you have wet cables. And this is real data that you're seeing here from, from garages that have been evaluated, but you see there's Quite a few of these tendons are falling right into that wet category. When you fall within that wet category, it's just like half cells that are telling you that you have high probability of corrosion. Doesn't mean that that is corroded at a particular time. You don't know when the moisture got in there, but you have the possibility and the potential in the long term. Moisture tends to just not leave a tendon on its own. It doesn't just exit the sheathing by itself. Lateral deflection, that's why I kind of held off on this one to kind of show you in the in the photos. So you need a mechanism in many cases to figure out, is the, are the tendons tensioned to their proper levels? And um, the particular photo here is a parking garage that was under construction and there was questions on the results of the elongations. You know, just admiralty, Some, things weren't looking right. So how do you figure that out? In many cases, the tails on, on those tendons have already been cut and it's tough to get a lift off test. And that's when you're pulling on that and looking at it. So this lateral deflection testing allows you to connect to the cable itself. And by putting a load cell on there and, and, and applying a known load to it, you could do the calculations to figure out um, the relative um, load, the uh, stressing level, how many kips do you have on that tendon? Is it within the parameters that you need? And of course, this here is a good example. Of, this is a button head system out in Kansas City at the airport, and they were doing a, a liftoff test in this particular case to figure out. And button head, if you have the right equipment to do it, button heads are a little bit easier to be able to do that liftoff test to pull back and see, okay, this is how much load it took to pull it back. These are the characteristics of the cable. How much tension is uh, is on there? So now we're going to start working our way through three case studies. And I have to monitor myself because I added another case study here. So um, the first case study is regarding drying. And this is a really good example from the University of Missouri, Columbia, Columbia uh, Missouri. Um, structures built in 1985. Pretty typical what you're going to look at. Three levels, one, one level slab on grade. And it's always it always seems like it's the same triggers. You know, what is there a problem? Well, you have a problem because you start having um, tendons that are starting to rupture and, you know, it starts becoming concerning. Obviously, we got an issue. I always say that there's ways of determining before you get to that back. But anyways, it, it's it's that's the most common way. So that triggered an evaluation. Engineers did an excellent job of breaking this down, taking a look at it, really doing some detailed work. Very concerning. You know, when they looked at 39 tendons, they found 17 of them were broken. Very concerning. What's causing that? What's what's the root cause? Start diving into it. Starting to look and doing some evaluation. So this photo on that screen is one of the anchorage points, you know, 
saturated, a lot of corrosion going on. So you can see that moderate to severe corrosion on 80% of the tendons. And they did that both by physical investigation and by half cell testing to be able to look at that. Um, and then, then 64 tendons were done where, as far as visual observations and screwdriver test, uh, penetration test. Um, here's a good photo of, of when you do an investigation. Of course, when you're working with tendons, you got to be careful. You got to really work, engage, and work with somebody that understands how to work with post tensioning. You could damage things very easily. So, opening this tendon up on, at the University of Missouri at the medical center, you can see a lot of rust pack here already. Oh, the grease is emulsified from what you can see from there, a lot of corrosion. Obviously, you have signs of moisture penetration or moisture issues that are in that sheathing. You obviously, very easy to figure out where the where the tendons are, where the anchorages are um, with the amount of corrosion coming back through the grout pockets. So don't worry, not going to read all this. This is just details for you guys to absorb as you go into it, but I really I'll focus on on the highlighting on one of the important steps that, that they put in place as part of the repair strategy is figure out, OK, we know that we have a moisture issue. Let's go ahead and let's look at a solution for removing the moisture from those strands and doing a regreasing process. So this is the actual data from that. You can see the cluster when you're looking at the, the cluster of moisture in this particular section uh, of the garage. All of them are, well, all but one are in the wet. And some are significantly in the wet freight phase of that. So high level, high potential levels of corrosion. So what is the drying process? What do you do to mitigate that? So there is a drying process that allows you to remove the moisture from the tendons. Again, you go back to an input and an output and you have a uh, you have a dry air generation center and I have some photos here and you're going to inject super dry air over an extended period of time, and it's gonna go through that tendon, and you may have to have multiple inputs and multiple outputs along the length of that tendon, but you're going to be running that extremely dry air through that tendon that's going to be absorbing the moisture as it goes through and then going through the output, so you're gonna be able to lower that. Um, here's the air generation system and one of the examples. Uh, this really scales up and down in the amount of equipment determining on the number of tendons. You could be 50 tendons, you could be 600 tendons that you're that you're addressing. Um, I have a video coming up here as well, but this is what your injection port. So your photo on the left is going to show you what it looks like. So what happens is a pocket is chipped out. And in this particular case, because there are three banded tendons, in this case, right next to each other, a pocket is chipped out, the sheathing is removed from those cables, and these injection uh, manifold plates are put into place. And so we have what we're looking at, and there's actually a fifth one not shown in the photo on the right. So approximately, I think it was 14 tendons, banded tendons in this particular area. But we're injecting uh, dry air into those tendons. And then on the output side, we're monitoring that air coming out, and you're getting a baseline of where you're starting at from a moisture level. And then you're looking at trying to get that tendon from those those readings to that dry level. And that's your goal. So is that achieved in two weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks? You know, that's kind of the time frame that you're working at. Really depends on the characteristics. How much rust pack is there? Uh, how much moisture was to begin with? How many intermediate anchors and, uh, and old repairs do you have to deal with? There's a lot of factors that need to be taken into account. I'm gonna hit the play on this. Hopefully everything works right because people, when we talk about moisture in it, a lot of people are thinking, well, humidity and stuff along those lines. It is very common to see issues like this. You should be able to see that water dripping out of there. All of that water that you see that's, that's coming out of those, uh, I think there's nine tendons in that area. All of that water that's coming out of there is all coming out of the sheathing. And the only reason that is coming out of it is because you're putting the air pressure on there. So uh, one of the questions that always gets asked is, OK, how much pressure are you putting on there? You know, is it 100, 200, 300 PSI? What are you doing? 
doesn't really take that much pressure to move through it. You, we may be running from 15 to 30 PSI from a pressure standpoint. What the real key is, is the, the amount of CFMs. How much, how much air, physical air are you moving through there? The drier the air and the more you move through it, the quicker you're able to dry those tendons out and reduce the risk of corrosion. Oops, let's skip over. Some of the things to take into account, keep track of my time. Some of the things to take into account, it just like I mentioned, uh, determines your length is, and this photo is showing you that we're skipping over intermediate uh, anchorages or sections where there is a ten, there's an anchorage in there. And when, this, when these anchorages were put in, the sheathing was stripped out about 12 to 18 inches on either side of that of that anchor. And this was used to be done so they could, and wasn't replaced back in the day because that's how they stressed it. So they had to sh strip the sheathing off, be able to get down to their bare metal. Well, that bare metal, sometimes, you know, when you just have the tendon itself and you don't have the sheathing, it doesn't move through there properly. So what we're doing is jumping over that intermediate. Some of the air is definitely still going through, but we're allowing uh, that CFMs to move through in the entire length of the tendon. Um, then it really gets into having excellent technicians that are, are keeping track and monitoring your drying. You want to make sure that your dry air is meeting your specifications. Then you're going to be keeping track of what, how quickly those tendons, because the moisture level in every tendon is different when you start off. So the amount of time that it takes to dry um, is, is different. So now you get done drying. You remove all the water. What's next? What happens? Well, the next step you want to do is you want to go back and you want to do a re-greasing process. Um, because in most cases, especially when you have severe uh, moisture issues, a lot of times that grease becomes emulsified. So we'll we'll go ahead and put uh, PTI certified grease. Um, it's very important that you're using a PTI certified grease back into those sheathings and inject it in there and push it through the length of those sheathings. And that takes multiple injection points to be able to do that. And it does two things. One, that, that grease encapsulates and protects that tendon from future moisture if, if that happens. And then that grease also has corrosion inhibitors built in to slow down that, that um, corrosion process that has already started. So very important to be able to do back, go back and do that. There are obviously some challenges with this when depending on what you're looking looking at. Of course, this is for model strand systems. The drying process is completely applicable to grouting systems. We've done that on grouted tendons on bridges, dried those out as well and removed the moisture. Um, but with this one, you go back and you, you grease this and you'd be able to protect the model strands. Um, so now at this point, um, Looking like we're moving well on time. So excellent, um, excellent repair job opportunity in Buffalo, New York. Um, the Henry Oshinskiski parking garage, named after a, a, a famous um, Buffaloite, I guess is the term, was uh, a parking garage associated with the with a hospital. The hospital went through many phases. I think it was built in. 1905 or something along those lines. Wonderful history. Love diving into the history of these structures and the backgrounds. But anyways, the built the parking garage is built in 74. It was closed in about 2015. When it was closed, it had issues to begin with, and nobody addressed those issues. Uh, very smart developers come along and said, you know what, this is an up and coming area. It's a beautiful area of Buffalo. Uh, they're, so they're putting in both residential and commercial um, complexes in this area, and they want to make this this parking um, parking lot kind of the, the highlight of this to be able to tie this all together. So excellent plan, really good idea. Um, this is this is the top level of what you're seeing. So you have three levels, two of them two of them are elevated, one of them is on on grade, uh, not unusual, fairly good size. So you have two two ramps going up on each one i mean fairly good size uh structure overall Three thousand square feet of concrete repairs is what they were estimating a lot of traffic coating 
Um, there was a traffic coding system on there, so they really just trying to do touch ups and fix where that traffic coding needed to be done, lighting all the rest of it. You can notice that, and I don't want to skip over this because these go the sister, the sister, the cousin to PT repairs is is barrier cables because it's very, very similar in many ways. And you can see here that there's some barrier cable issues. Um, the engineer did an excellent job at evaluating it and really doing some investigations, being a chip out and taking a look at the tendons, uh, looking at the anchorage points, doing some half cells. And so big structure, a lot of unknowns, can't really, didn't really know what's going on, but at the same time, they kind of ballparked it at a 20 to 40 tendon uh, replacement. So they did a very, very good job when you see at the end uh, of kind of highlighting where they might be. Here's another video. I think you get the idea that water that you see here again, water is your is your is your arch enemy here. That water is I think it started raining about five minutes before I shot shot this video because I was already inside the garage. It was completely dry. It started raining. So the it's not so you have water coming over the sides coming back in. Now I'm on the second level, obviously. And then you have water that is that is just flowing through broken pipes. And that entire second level was completely saturated. Of course, your top level saturated, but a lot of parking garages aren't making accommodations for your lower levels for traffic coatings, or they're just doing the drive lanes. Well, in this particular case, you could see where's my water source coming from? Well, it's pretty, pretty evident. And this is the outcome when you have significant amount of water and under protection you start having significant corrosion i put on here about the sheathing repairs and i'll talk a little bit more about the sheathing repairs but it's very important now I'll, I'll cover that when we come to that slide we'll come come to that um, some more of the tent of uh, the tendon conditions that we're finding a lot of these tendons what you see here are photos after they started doing did they started removing some of the concrete delaminations is where you start to see these broken tendons so this is uh, this is an important meeting that's going on right here you can see all the all the smart people standing around uh, i'm the one taking the photo so obviously you know, you know they left me out of this but anyways but so we're having a very important meeting here on site being able to meet with the engineers and the and the owner the gc over the entire project and talk about okay we have specifications we have written lots of words pages and pages of specifications but when it gets down to it we really need to have a discussion point and 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 early on in the process to get everybody calibrated because it's really easy to write up a bunch of words. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's easy to cut and paste a bunch of words that say this is the level of corrosion, et cetera, et cetera. But you really need to be able to go back and say, OK, this is this is my idea of acceptable um, amounts of corrosion on a tendon. And this is my level of unacceptable amount of corrosion on a tendon. And that tendon needs to be replaced. It's very important that your repair contractor and your engineer get on the same page with that because if you have five thousand dollars to repair a tendon and the contractor is just trying to read through the text and try to try to figure out okay is this is this you know is that pitting point one micron deeper you know it becomes very difficult but you have a higher level of trust when you could be meeting on site and reviewing some examples and kind of calibrating that Sheathing repairs, another very important ones, and I kind of skipped over that a little bit earlier, but PTI has some very excellent um, specifications that talk about sheathing repair, but it give you a lot of lateral movement, but there needs to be discussion because if you get into do sheathing repairs and you need to tape it up and do it properly, you have a few hours, you have two hours to do a sheathing repair in many cases because you're gonna have to chip around a tension tendon. And you, so it's not like you pick the tendon up and I could tape it. This sucker is not going to move. So now I'm doing extra chipping, a lot of cost associated with that. Or are there little nicks on the top of it and everything around it is perfectly. So now we're going to go in with a PTI approved liquid um, tape that you can put over the top of that without actually disturbing all of the concrete around it. And those are things that are taken care of in that contractor engineer meeting. 
Oh, and then um, I'm going to skip over right here to shoring. So the shoring piece, um, I often see in specifications, and, and it's kind of like the, I call it the punt, is GC is completely in charge of all shoring. Well, if the scope of the project isn't defined well enough, like where is shoring going to be needed? Well, we don't know. We don't know where the broken tendons are. So just wherever shoring is needed, just, well, if you have 40 tendons and they're all concentrated in one part of the garage, then you have a significant issue, but your shoring could be all in one part of the garage. If it's spread throughout the entire structure, it's different. So I really, I really stress for the owner's benefit because you know the only one person who makes money on shoring is a shoring company. So sorry, any shoring companies out there, but really go in with a collaborative approach and say, you know what, we know that there's a shoring number that needs to be carried and needs to be taken into consideration, but let's do this intelligently. And I, I give kudos here for the owner of this project and the engineers. They really worked this through and because it, the shoring really grew a lot more than, than was originally anticipated. But the GC also didn't put a huge number in there and, you know, you know, it just it worked out. It was a really good collaboration. Always go, obviously, with a professional shoring design, um, you know, follow the best practices where possible. Always go down to slab on grade and be able to build from there because it's really the backbone. That PT is really your backbone of that garage and you don't want to create more problems. So you get into the actual repair here. And so this repair is midstream. And so I grabbed a little bit of photos here. So the, the photo on the left is a center stressing anchor. I, I have somehow got dog bone in my head and that's kind of a field technology term for it, but a center stressing anchor, which is a little bit more of a mouthful, is, is, your, is your bread and butter of the re tendon repair business. So you can see this, uh, what I like about this photo is the, is the, um, the <clears throat> repair technician has started to put the, the petroleum tape, the, the waterproof taping around um, the dog bone, around your stressing anchor. He also has it painted where the stressing um, he's got a three inch spot there and then he's painted a nice bright white, very easy to read. And that marking is there because you're, this gives you a nice clear ability after you stress it to get your elongations on those tails. How far did that move? And then when this repair is stressed and completed, those that they're sheathing that's put around. So there's no bare wire that's showing. Everything is wrapped up and protected, so you you keep the moisture issue. On those typical tendon repairs, you're looking at a four foot to one by one foot wide uh, full depth repair. That's very important because depending on the length of what that tendon is, that that um, center stressing anchor will move as you stress it. It needs room to move through that through that structure. On your right, you're looking at a splice. It's what I call it, a splice chuck. And that's where you're actually taking the, the, the old tendon and the new tendon and the red one in the, in the, the red tendon is the new one in that particular case, and you're connecting those back together again. So same idea. This will be completely taped up. No bare wires when this is done. Um, it will be um, protected and then stressed and then the repair concrete poured back around it. Um, and these tend to move not as far sometimes. So you're looking at here somewhere between 24 and 30 inches, 30, 30 inches in length for that particular one. Really a good repair uh, company will understand that the length of the tendon it, it directly correlates with the amount of elongation that goes on and how much room you need to account for. Here's some more examples of some of the repairs that are coming into. So if you look at the right photo, you can see that you have your stressing uh, anchor on the left in that left one. And then you see um, it's not too far up there um, near that um, uh, barrier, the orange barrier cone. You see where the splice is for that particular one. And then the other one actually has that tendon because of the way that tendon runs actually it has to run all the way up to almost to the top of that ramp where the splice is. So there's a lot longer process of elongation in that tendon. 
Um, I probably should move this into the beginning, but I really like when an engineer and the repair um, company can get together and talk about documentation because sometimes the engineers have specifics that they want you to exactly follow. But a lot of if you get an experienced PT repair technician, they have a very structured, very documented process by which they use. And you may really like how they do that and it carries a lot of information. So if you are able to blow into this and look into this document a lot closer, you'd be able to see all of the stressing anchors, the locations are highlighted, all of the um, splices, the lengths of the cables, and then it ties right in. Each each of those tendons is numbered, and then you could take that straight right back to your stressing records and be able to see the specifics of it. Um, not to be forgotten is, and I'll move a little bit quicker through this, not to be forgotten is your barrier cables. So in this particular repair, that column in the left, that that nothing's been done to that other than just it's fallen apart. Um, so we took this turnbuckle system that was in place and converted it. So removing those turnbuckles, it's, that turnbuckle goes to probably a four inch anchor. And then it had two steel nuts and a wedge on the end of that inside the concrete. And those had to be removed. Just absolutely horrible going through and removing those. But what we did is because the columns were not strong enough to be able to hold up to the modern standards of the expectations of barrier cables, those had to be um, enlarged by, I believe it's 12 inches they had to be enlarged by. So both the top and the bottom of that, uh, of that column was enlarged and then uh, drilled through. And so you can see this is 270 um, 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 KSI um, galvanized uh, half inch tendon. Uh, goes to a galvanized anchor and wedge system, uh, all designed to hold up to the outside. And then one of the very important um, um, quality control pieces, and I always do this by feel, but the, here's a photo of it, is finding those teeth marks on the back side because you have to you have to back stress those to a certain kip to be able to make sure the wedges are seated properly. And it's very easy to go through long and just feel it. Do you feel those teeth marks in there? So here's a summary of where we end, where, 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 what we ended up with. So estimated 40, but we ended up with 55 tendons being repaired. Found a particular area was is is pretty bad shape. 115 sheathing repairs, a lot of, and those sheathing repairs. I truly believe a lot of that was from previous, not from this GC, but from previous concrete repairs, because you could see where the old uh, repair mortar was underneath the sheathing. So they had repaired this garage numerous times over the past, and that, that contractor just nicked up that tendon, never did anything about it, just poured back over it, which you don't see doesn't hurt you. 15,000 linear feet of barrier cables, and 32 columns enlarged in that process. So excellent project, really good coordination. Engineers were, were phenomenal. The owner was really good. It was good, good to work on that one. And then I'm a, I want to leave time for questions, but I do want to cover this one, the Sixth six Street uh, Parkade up in Bismarck, North Dakota, lovely area. Um, so this garage built in the 60s, you can read all the details. It's a button head system, two-way button head system. So this is one of the older styles. Uh, the slab was only six and a half inches um, thick. So this had gotten, and there was a number of very, uh, you know, you, I'm not going to go through all the different phases of the garage, but it had some really good uh, condition assessments in 14, 16, 19, followed up by repairs. A lot of traffic coating, a lot of traffic coating put down, uh, cathodic protection, other things in 2015 really, really addressed a lot of things, but then came back and said, okay, we got other parts of the garage. We have other issues with the butt head system that need to be addressed. Um, so the, the wires in the button head are starting to corrode, but a lot of them were still good. It just really depends on where it was in, in, in relations to the, the road salts coming in. So let's save what we have. And let's replace what what has failed. And they decided to replace it with a with a new half inch mono strand system. A lot of lot of intricacies with this. There was a there was a health clinic that was below in below the garage that that was still functioning. So you had to do all these repairs while 
you have that going on. So this was night work, by the way, extensive GPR work, figuring out what the configurations of all those tendons are. Shoring, which you may see in some of these photos, were both steel beams above and below in areas to be able to provide the proper shoring for it. So you could see on that left-hand side of that photo next to the trench is some of the steel uh, shoring that was on the top side. And, and the repair technicians in this case had to work around all of that. What the design was, a really clever design, was to, was to what they did was, OK, all the button head systems that had failed, we're just going to go ahead and remove those and replace that with that new monostern system. And we're going to put that in a 12 inch wide trench. And that trench is about three and a half inches deep. And that puts you kind of really right there at that center line. Um, but when you got down to that three and a half inches, you're also running right through the center line of your temperature tendons. So those temperature tendons, the ones that interfered with the trench, what they did was they cut a groove on either side of it. And the solution was to put number six bar epoxied in into, into the slab near surface epoxy there. Once that was in there and reached the, the proper um, strength, then they went ahead and cut and removed those temperature tendons. Once the temperature tendons were out of the way, that kind of freed it up so that we were able to lay four of the monostrand tendons properly spaced in there. And then each side of the trench, you also had number seven bar, I believe, on each side of the trench from a support standpoint. What I'm showing here is so the dead, the dead end of the anchorage, so the non-stressing side were replaced. So you can see the hairpins and everything that was done for that for the anchorages on the on the left hand side in that photo. And the right hand side, you could see one of these hold down plates. So the plates had to be put in there so that when you tensioned it, you didn't have those tendons want to pop up. You had to hold it in place. So those hold down plates were every 21 feet. Um, dead ends were approximately 30 square inches in, in, in full depth, number sevens. This is a nice better picture showing you up close how that configuration was. So what they did was they got everything in place, um, put a bunch of screws throughout it, stainless steel screws to help with that bond, and then stressed those tendons to three kips. Just enough pressure in there to straighten everything out, get everything just ready to go. And then they came back where those hold downs are and they put a, a high strength early cure mortar underneath there and that held it in place. Come back, you're able to uh, pour, tension and uh, you know they tensioned to 26 uh, kips after it got to 3000 psi well, those hold downs were important to kind of because you were not able to get that replacement profile in there so that kind of gave you the ability to keep that tendon from wanting to pop up very clever design worked very well okay we reached questions so i think i'm just going to say i nailed it for question time so what do we got <laughs> Very smart, Very smart, Mike. Let go there. there. It'll clear up in a second. Um, so, Mike, um, we have a lot of questions here. Uh, I've been madly responding to some of these to make sure we've addressed them all. Uh, and if you would like to submit another question for Mike to consider for the gift card, please do just include your full name so we know who you are. If you logged in anonymously, we have no idea. But we'll start from the beginning. We'll chew through as many as we can. How about that, Mike? Okay, uh, our good friend uh, uh, Brent Novak uh, is asking, is it common for PT tendons to erupt through the top of the slab, uh, seeing as how they are usually draped and sloped, wouldn't the water collect at the low points, causing the corrosion at, at the tendons to be near the bottom of the slab? Is there a reason why it erupts from the top or is it the bottom? Well, the, the eruption isn't always necessarily where, in fact, the eruption isn't necessarily where the corrosion is taking place and where that cable breaks. Because where that cable breaks, the tendon's on tension. So it shoots either direction. So you do see more eruptions through the low points and coming through the soffit versus the slab. But it's not, it, it really depends. You know, if you have a delamination or weakened concrete, in the slab part at the high point, then that's where when it when it pops and it separates and that force comes through, if that's a weak point, then it'll pop up there as well. Mm, okay, good to know. Mark Duncan is asking, um, we work on a parking garage that, is a, that, that has two-way flat slabs with an opening for a loading dock. The banded line orientation switches direction at the corner of the truck dock opening 
uh, and we are observing cracking at, at this discontinuity. Is there a recommended fix for this scenario? Uh, are there any other ways to proactively address this type of PT layout? And Mike, if you need to talk more information, and we can always talk to Mark offline. But um, what do you think? Yeah, there's well, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot that could be going on there. Um, two of the most common things I see when they are moving around to penetration. One is is they don't get the angles. They make too too abrupt of movements. There, there are specifications about how you get that bend in there. Sometimes they they too abrupt. Uh, or th when they move that and they have banded tendons and the tendons start binding up and start getting a lot closer, sometimes you have one on top of the other. And so you start having some stressing issue in there. And that all of that is very difficult sometimes to pour concrete. So you see hun honeycombing, or maybe there's not even concrete between the tendons and they're all smashed together. And those those are all situations that you get into that that will see some cracking around there. And you really got to get a good feel, you know, what is what is causing that? And once you understand what is that cause, what's the root cause, then you can start looking at ways to, of uh, of, of dealing with that. But yeah, there, there definitely are, are methodologies by which to, to, to fix that. I'll, I'll share Mike's contact information at the end of the questions here so we can uh, we can connect Mark with, with yourself and, and you guys can discuss what it might be as well. So maybe more information may be required. Um, another, Mike is asking, and this is a very predictive question, uh, can you predict uh, when a strand is going to break or the breakage rate of strands in general? I I have not been able to predict that. Um, no, I, I haven't. I haven't seen anything published that says that this is going to be because even if you even if you have a wet tendon and you say you know you have moisture in there, you don't know the rate of corrosion. Um, and certain strands react differently. You know, you can you can lose a single wire. In some in some cases, the, the tendon's fine. It's still under. Other times you lose a wire and the whole thing snaps. So there, there, unfortunately, I have not seen a good correlation to be able to tell you how quickly that does occur. Okay. There's a couple of questions here about the, the screwdriver test that you mentioned. Uh, I know you say it's tried and true, but there seems to be some variation from some of the people asking questions here. Uh, what is your approach when you test a cable uh, and can penetrate only between two watt, two of the wires, but the rest of the attempts are impenetrable? Would you consider this cable failed? I would consider that that cable suspect if because you have a seven wire system that's all tied together. If you can get between two, then more than likely what you have is you have a broken wire out of the seven. Now, how you treat that, um, you know, every engineer is a little bit different on how they want to approach it. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have an issue like that needs to be addressed right away, but you do need to be aware of that. You know, you you have the potential coming up at some point. And typically when you're doing the screwdriver test, I I, I don't always find that it's uniform. It's not like I can put that screwdriver through every single wire. Usually there's 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 some that are still still bound together because you have one king wire and six wrapped around it. So it it does have variations to it. But a okay. good tendon has has no penetration. You you're not able to get that to penetrate at all. It's 10-4, Roger. Um, Jeremy C is uh, curious. Um, he joined a little bit late, so I just wanted to ask, um, can you explain again how you would perform half cell testing or half cell survey on, on, on PT? Would it be the anchorage or the whole tendon? Um, how does that work? Yeah, um, it, it, so not to throw the variability in there, but if you have an, if you have uncoated or, or uncoated um, anchorage, and it typically in the design, you should be able to look this through this through GPR or just continuity testing. Is you know it has hairpins that are that are backup bars in there, and so now your entire rebar structure is is connected and part of that connectivity with that. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll go to the rebar if that's easier, or we'll go to the anchorage point is is our number two. And the number three is if we have to, we'll start getting into like a grout pocket and getting to the tendon itself if, if available. 
OK, Mark has a question here, just very similar, but if you're using the uh, the extruded chief tendons, the ones that are completely electrically isolated, uh, it, it is very challenging to, to use half cell surveys on, on that. Is, it, is that correct? That, that is absolutely correct. Same thing with the modern systems where the ten, where the uh, where the anchorages are completely encapsulated as well. You get very difficult, but I will tell you that if you are if you are finding active corrosion, um, in those situations, maybe you have a poor insulation or some damage that was done or, you know, some other factors in there. OK, here's a really interesting question from Anonymous. I, I, I believe I asked this person for their name, but uh, I can't remember who it was now. It might have been Seth, uh, our friend Seth here. Is there any interaction between the dry air and the grease on the tendons that should be considered when you're pumping either for the testing you've mentioned or for the drying solution? I haven't seen anything where, where, where we have any kind of negative inter interaction between the grease itself, especially when you're coming back and doing the re-greasing. If you are, have wet tendons, almost every case I'm finding either really poor, poor non-existent grease at that point, or you're, you're, it's already emulsified and in, in bad shape. It's very, very, well, it happens, but you know, it's, it's never, but the, the, the majority of the time when you're coming into it, you're you're having significant areas of of, of grease grease issues to begin with. OK, there's uh, more questions coming in all the time here. Uh, Jeremy C has another question. He's really gunning for that gift card, my friend. Yeah, um, good job, Jeremy. Another question. Uh, what is your experience with galvanized strand? So the galvanized strand is my experience is to using it in um, barrier cables. Uh, not in the the galvanizing process itself um, affects the the strength of the of those tendons to a certain degree. So I've not seen any specifications where you can use galvanized in in the in the slabs themselves. But I, maybe maybe that potential is out there. It's just I'm not aware of it. Okay. Uh, so our friend Seth here, who I believe asked the, the prior question there. He's also asking, uh, he's looking for that gift card as well, apparently. Um, is there a tendency for moisture to get reintroduced to cables after air drying since it isn't necessarily addressing the source of the moisture? Uh, what sort of service life extension can you generally expect from, from the drying? Oh man, that's that's a great one. And and I got on my little construction high, high horse last time and spent maybe too much time talking about it, but I cannot reemphasize enough the importance of addressing the source of the problem versus addressing the moisture issue, you know, because it's a waste of time. Spend the money on a good traffic coating system. Take care of your expansion joints. If you put the money into those things in the forefront, like which I'm preaching to the choir here, you you will eliminate a lot of these issues to begin with. But that all the repairs and that I kind of skipped over it in the Bismarck, but that 2015, a lot of that emphasis was get in there, get a proper traffic coating, control your moistures, eliminate the source, then come back and look at the drying. Don't, right. don't do it backwards. We're closing on time. I realize my, my watch is a little bit different than my laptop time here. So uh, one last question, and I apologize. We've only been able to get through a small fraction of the number of questions that were asked. Um, question from goes to Tom. Um, what is the typical factor of safety when designing a PT system? In other words, how many tendons can you lose before the deck would be compromised? Good question. Excellent question. I don't know that answer. I, I hesitate. You know, it's one of these where you got an answer in your head, but I hesitate throwing something out there because it's it really depends on 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 the on a lot of factors. And I don't want to I don't want to punt that one down the road, but but I'm going to leave that up to uh, a certified engineer to be able to answer that in many cases. So, OK, well, you punted that question, so I'm going to ask one more then. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mark F is asking, and this is the last question that was just asked on the on the forum here. Um, is acoustic monitoring still being used to locate uh, where wire breaks occur? Absolutely. Acoustic monitoring, I think, has a has a has a good future. Um, right now, I see a lot of a lot of good applications where they're really working through on state cable bridges, you know, and and, and bridges in general, you know, ones where that have such a high degree of, of, you know, impact if something fails. Um, acoustic monitoring in garages on monostrand. Um, I know that technology is available. 
Um, just haven't seen it in use a lot. And and if there's, I'm sure there's newer technologies coming starts coming into it. But it really becomes a cost discussion, right? How much is the monitoring? How much is just doing proper maintenance in the first part? You know, what's the repair cost? Because a lot of people, a lot of the attitude sometimes goes, well, why dry it? Or why why treat this? We'll just repair we'll just repair a tendon as it breaks. Okay, that works for the first few times. What's what's that impact on your clients or or your or your employees or your customers or something along those lines? If you have a couple tendons break in the same area, now you're starting to put up shoring and you're losing parking spots, so it may may um, equal revenue. You know what's that look like? And so really try to. Try not to just say, hey, we'll just repair tendons. Get down to the root source or the source of your moisture or what the problem is. Address that and then start looking at, at, at the monitoring piece of that. Thanks, Mike. So we've only gotten through a fraction of the questions. We're going to close off today. Uh, sorry to Sophie, Amar, Samantha, Mike, man, the list goes on, Dan. Um, but, you know, I do know that Mike does like hearing questions directly on his cell phone. So call him night or day. Here's his cell number on the screen right now. Uh, his email address is also here. So I'll leave that up for a second so you can jot it down. So coming up next is um, is is in February 9th is structural strengthening with fiber reinforced polymers for parking structures. Uh, as well on March 9th, uh, we have concrete repair and uh, carbon fiber tea biscuits for parking structures, which is a unique way of repairing double T couplers uh, that you may not be aware of. So that's with uh, Andrew Brecker on the 9th and with Ryan Fleming on the on the 9th of, uh, of March. So we have a couple good webinars coming up. We hope you join us for those. Uh, just come back to wesavestructures.info um, that has uh, has the registration link there. So that brings us to the end of the webinar for today. Uh, thank you to Mike for sharing your expertise and uh, and your experience in the field with us. It's clear that you, you, you're you hands on with a lot of these projects in the field and we appreciate you uh, sharing the stories. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Really appreciate the attendance and the questions. Wish we had more time to get to them all, but definitely give us a call. Thank you. There'll be, there'll be another time for sure. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I know it's uh, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening for you. We appreciate your your attending us, attending the webinar today. Uh, please go out there and save some structures and uh, be safe. And we'll see you next time.